Hello everyone and welcome to today's Stats Cafe on mapping land cover change using remote sensing and GIS. Now we selected the topic for today's Stats Cafe in response to the growing interest and ongoing discussions about the need to transform national statistical systems, transform our processes and our products. And uh, in these discussions, there's a lot of focus on big data, and there's a lot of focus on data integration, in particular, integration of geospatial and statistical information. And this is really what we'll try during the next hour to dig a bit into. More specifically, what we aim to do is to state the case for land cover change map mapping, why is it important? Why is it useful? What kind of policy questions can this help us answer? And then we aim to provide some very practical advice and guidance for those of you who wish to get started with producing your own maps and your own data visualizations. My name is uh, Rika Hansen. I work in the statistics division of SCAP and it's my pleasure to moderate the Stats Cafe today. As you noticed on the flyer, we will have two main speakers uh, and I will introduce them in more details uh, just before I ask them to present. After we've heard from our two main presenters, I'll call on a few select members of the audience who've, um, who are or have been involved in the work of SCAP on this topic. Uh, we'll then move on to questions and answers and thank you uh, to the many of you who have taken the opportunity to send us questions in advance. We'll give those questions some priority. I've clustered some of them and we'll ask our speakers uh, those questions afterwards. We'll then hopefully have some time for live Q&A as well after that, before we reach the conclusion of uh, our one hour. Uh, but uh, without further ado, let me introduce our first presenter, Chitrini Musunda. Chitrini is an affiliated faculty and research scientist at the Asian Institute of Technology here in Thailand. And her research interests include remote sensing and GIS applications for environmental monitoring and management, land use change analysis and modeling, spatial analysis and decision support. And uh, what uh, Chitrini will do today is to help me and the team here really state the case for land cover change mapping, talk a bit about the research she's involved in and elaborate on some of the burning policy questions that uh, with these tools and technologies we can help get answered. So without further ado to Chitrini, the floor is yours. Uh, I look forward to listening to your presentation, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I yeah, can hear you. Okay. And yeah, I can thank also you. see your presentation. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, such a, a nice uh, welcome. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, from different parts of the world, as I'm informed. Uh, and thanks, UNSK, uh, especially the Stats Cafe team, for arranging this and inviting me for this session. My name is Dr. Chitrini Majumdar. And uh, as uh, Ricky already uh, informed, uh, I'm an affiliated faculty and research scientist uh, in AIT, Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. And uh, today I'm here to give uh, an uh, uh, opening remark uh, for the, today's discussion. And my topic uh, is uh, uh, analysis of land use cover change for sustainable development, uh, where I, I mostly focus in. So before I proceed to the main topic, I'd like to introduce our team at AIT. So AIT completed 60 years last year 
which provide high, uh, high end knowledge and provide uh, postgraduate degrees in various fields. Uh, we are a group of enthusiastic scientists uh, working in an international environment, as you can see from the flags. Uh, we come from different uh, countries, but in a very friendly environment, and we have the same goal to share knowledge and uplift the education in geoinformatics. We have uh, various expertise uh, uh, focusing in several research domains, as you can see, uh, right from health GIS to agroinformatics, uh, uh, land use cover change uh, in changing climate scenarios right now, crop modeling, positioning and mobile technology, disaster management, uh, big data and uh, Hadoop sensor network processing and stuff. Uh, this, these are just a few uh, words that I have chosen, but we, we do uh, a lot of uh, applications in, in several areas uh, of, uh, of the earth. Uh, and I mainly focus on uh, land use, land cover change analysis. Uh, from AIT, we, as I said, we give uh, uh, master's and PhD degrees. So we do uh, the post uh, postgraduate degrees, but we also have certificate programs and like we also do uh, certificates, customized certificates and uh, uh, trainings for different government agencies and industries in various fields. So that's what uh, is uh, about us. Now let's proceed to the main topic uh, of today. So land, you say land, land cover change, uh, as I'm informed that most of you might be aware that it refers to the study of uh, land surface change, uh, which my, might have occurred due to uh, natural causes or human modifications of the terrestrial surface. Uh, this is an uh, animation of the global change uh, from 1984 to 2014 captured from uh, the Google Earth Engine platform, which is uh, widely used nowadays for these change kind of studies. Uh, the changes here we can see uh, can be the modifications, uh, like uh, because land use change, we talk about into two groups, basically land modifications or land conversions. So you can see some of the modifications may be quite precisely like the glacial male melt uh, in the upper band of the window uh, in your screen. Uh, the, the conversions may be uh, more prominent uh, in the next few animations like this one, like how uh, the urbanization happening and then land is getting converted from some other class, other land cover classes to uh, built ups uh, a river morphologist might be uh, interested for from this window uh, might be interested for studying the meanderings uh, in this uh, 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 in this uh, uh, change uh, patterns. But probably an urban planner or an environmentalist will be most uh, most uh, uh, interested to see how uh, the urbanization is happening and then what are the environmental impacts, uh, the eco ecosystem services are impacting and so on. So uh, from one uh, particular scene, we actually understand a lot and based on the different purpose of the study, uh, we, we gather the information from, from these changes. Uh, this is an, another example of how rapidly uh, urbanization does take place. You can see uh, the years uh, going in the uh, left hand upper hand corner of the window. So uh, this is an example of uh, uh, urbanization from Suzhou, China. Uh, this is another example from another part, how rapidly the natural uh, uh, land cover is transforming to uh, uh, agricultural lands and some of the built ups uh, 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 in, 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 in some area. And this is natural, this is normal, but uh, what we have to do is uh, gather the uh, information and then, uh, I mean, uh, uh, implement on, on, uh, on the plannings, the policies uh, that we make for betterment of the particular area that we are looking into. Uh, well, the land use change studies are not new. Uh, actually, this has been there from, say, uh, five, six decades, probably, or more from when uh, these satellite images uh, have been in practice. 
Uh, it was initially dominated by uh, the monitoring and modeling of ecological impacts of major land cover changes uh, on the natural system, uh, then driving factor change and causal patterns. What are the main causes of these changes? Then what human interactions with uh, natural surroundings, including land management and the uh, provisioning of wide range of ecosystem services. Uh, and orientation towards the sustainability always has been a constitutive element of land use cover change studies. However, uh, the key questions lie similar, like uh, what's on the land surface and how these have changed over time, uh, depending on the locations and purpose of the study, there can be more uh, some site specific questions as well, like uh, where these changes have occurred and how fast or can be linked to the global issues like food security or red policies uh, and so on. Finally, it has to link to the market and non-market monetary value uh, of the land where the land accounting does. There are several key aspects which need uh, consideration. These slides might look like uh, academic one, but uh, since this is important part of uh, how when we do a land use change analysis uh, or, or, or mapping. So uh, this is that's why I thought this will be important. Uh, there are several key aspects uh, which are uh, which needs consideration. Uh, two of the most important being spatial aspect and uh, temporal aspects. In the first six figures, uh, in the left-hand side, where you see uh, uh, image of, say, T0 time and T1 time, so before and after, and then you see some change. Uh, in the first case, uh, the high-resolution high image is able to capture the change that has happened to, from say, uh, T0 to T1. So uh, probably whatever happened here, say, in the pink color was actually captured in the, in the change image. But if you have a, a, a low resolution image, uh, might not be uh, uh, captured well. But it doesn't matter if you actually do a, a global scale change detection or change uh, analysis and you are okay to neglect the small changes. So that's what uh, the key point is, because I get several questions like, which is the uh, correct data set, satellite data that should be used for the change analysis, but it actually depends on your scale, uh, on, on which you are actually working on a global, or you are actually uh, working on uh, parcels of uh, say buildings. So uh, for pro probably when you need detailed information on changes, uh, a high resolution image will be must. Similarly, the temporal uh, aspects, for example, in the right hand side images uh, uh, where you have A, B and C and again B. So there are say two cases mainly, the A case and the B case. Uh, in A case, it seems uh, there might be a a uh, 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 random or, or a gradual change from T0 to T1. So taking uh, images like uh, from uh, your T0 and T1 should be fine. But uh, even then there might be some uh, internal small changes in between, which might be uh, not so visible uh, from, from if, you, if you take actually these two images, because what you are doing uh, in between is completely neglecting. Uh, in, in this case, it might be still okay if, if this is a, a, a small change and, and not, not much abrupt changes have, have happened in this uh, case. But in the second case where actually uh, you see abrupt changes in the, these two cases uh, in B, uh, it, it might not be okay if you actually want to uh, capture the uh, if you want to capture the changes in the two times. And uh, now uh, the UN has already estimated that the human footprints uh, that has affected 83% of the global terrestrial land surface and has degraded about 60% of the ecosystem services in the past 50 years alone. 
Uh, land use land cover uh, change has been the most visible indicator of human footprint and most important drivers of loss of biodiversity and also other forms of the land degradation. And we already realized probably to work together uh, in a direction of development or, and sustainability wherever you are probably working in. Uh, actually, it has already started. Uh, the United Nations uh, 2030 Agenda uh, for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which we in short know as SDG, presents a roadmap and consent, uh, unconcerted platform of action towards achieving sustainable and inclusive development, leaving no one behind actually, while preventing environmental degradation and loss of natural resources. So in order to reshape policies and management frameworks conforming to objectives of SDGs, SDGs uh, it is uh, very important to understand the driving mechanisms of land use changes and determine the future patterns of change. And in fact, this has been already started. Uh, one example is the Future Art, which is uh, an international platform for research, innovation, and collaborations uh, working to accelerate the global uh, sustainability. Uh, how we can uh, contribute? Uh, we, we may not have all the answers, but uh, we can still compare. We can compare and decide the best use of natural resources probably and manage better. Otherwise, how do we decide on the use of uh, natural resources uh, or how much urban areas do we need for survival in say 2050 or so? Uh, we, can, we can contribute uh, uh, by, uh, by this, that what, what I'm going to uh, speak next. So by this, what I mean is to analyze land use cover changes and explore Ch Ch scenario. Titrini, yes. sorry for interrupting. Is it possible for you yeah. to wrap up within the next two minutes? Yes, sure. I'm wrapping up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So what I mean is to analyze land use uh, changes and explore scenarios in the future. Uh, in this slide, for example, TP is the present date, and these are, say, uh, some uh, previous years, which can be used to model to the future, say, TP plus 10 uh, in the scenarios. Different scenarios can be compared. Uh, not only that, actually, we can see uh, 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 which scenario is the best for us, uh, fulfilling our proposed goals. So our master plans uh, for each national belief, like uh, uh, we have some master plans with, with some proposed built up areas or proposed conservation areas. So we can actually see which scenario will fulfill our criteria in terms of uh, uh, our development areas or in terms of our uh, services that we expect from the environment. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Actually, uh, this is this phase is still continuing, and the implementation phase is uh, uh, is still on. Uh, some of the European countries have already uh, implemented their uh, scenario. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 comparisons, uh, and then uh, 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 having plans for a sustainable development uh, already in, in practice. Uh, so these are some platforms I thought will be useful to visualize land use change and you actually can also do uh, uh, land use change uh, work if you are interested to learn. Uh, so uh, this is an example of Google Earth Engine which is being uh, used. Uh, this is a living land which gives story maps. This is from ISRI uh, 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 how, how the global uh, art is changing. And this is an example from uh, global forest change which also uses Google Earth Engine in the back end. So that's all from now, and I look forward to the uh, question uh, and answer session. And uh, I can be reached at uh, uh, chitrini at ait.ac.ph, and this is our website. Uh, thanks, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Chitrini, for, for giving us a sense of um, of the use and also the how to adapt the type of analysis that can be used. Uh, really, as I see it, the key message here is 
adapt the types of data, the resolution, the frequency of measurements to the actual use that you want to make of the analysis you are entertaining. Uh, so thank you very much, Ticherini, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, many of you jotted down Ticherini's email address. I know that she's uh, very keen also to continue the Q&A, maybe in writing after we finish today's session, which is very short. But thank you very much, Titrini, and uh, we will move on to our next speaker, and then we'll take the Q&As a bit later. Uh, so it is now my pleasure to invite our second presenter, uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Alat uh, Munsuru, who's who's working here uh, at SCAP in the statistics division. He works here as a GIS specialist uh, and uh, he is like uh, Chitrini very interested and uh, is, is doing uh, research in remote sensing and GIS applications. Uh, particularly at the moment he's developing tools uh, to monitor land cover change, do the maps, uh, he's also involved in our work on ocean accounting and uh, disaster risk assessment. And uh, Alad will uh, present his work and give you uh, a taste of the kind of tools that we hope to be able to disseminate to all of you shortly. Uh, we will also, uh, as part of the um, of the presentation, hear briefly from another close colleague of mine, Ms. Ayo Marshall, who is. Uh, who's working closely with Alad and the rest of the team here to, to finish off these tools so that they can be of mutual use to, to all of you. Uh, so Alad, uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, Ricky, for the introduction. And uh, I'm Ahlad, and uh, I'm currently working as a GS consultant. In this presentation, we'll know a brief uh, regarding land accounting and land cover change mapping for macro scale. And uh, these are the tools which we have developing, how the land was changing, and with a temporal interval from uh, 1992 to 2018, we can see a series of land cover change. And uh, regarding this, We have taken a prototype to test these tools for the Ganga Brahmaputra River Basin, uh, which is the largest river basin in Asia, which covers the major countries in uh, Asian countries like India, China, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Bhutan. And uh, we can see a clear difference here from 1992 to 2015. It's quite interesting for me. It's a place from India. And I have checked when, when we have simulated a tool of land cover change, I felt interesting in this particular region why this been changing. It's been a series of change, a gradual development from uh, 20 years we have observed at, the, at this particular region. And uh, regarding this, uh, these are the classifications which we have developed. It's according to CR land cover classifications. And uh, here we can see the how these methodologies and uh, how it was being developed, we can see now. This is the overall concept of our study. It was distinguished into three parts. First is the data collection and the cleaning of the data and then the automation. Regarding the data collection, we use the ISRI data, ESA data sets, which is free. And uh, for, uh, for regarding the Ganga Brahmaputra River Basin's boundaries, World, World Bank has provided the free data of global river basins. This is the link. And, uh, this for countries level scale data, GADM, we can download the countries level data sets. And from these data sets, we can use QGS to completely pre process all the data sets in one click by using this plugin, semi automatic plugin. If we install this and uh, if you load all this raster files, and we can uh, simulate at once. It's very very simple and handy tool to use this. And when we get the process data sets, we can simulate using R and we can see the land transition matrix and percentage of change and auto maps from 1995 to 2015. Every year interval complete data analysis we can get within no time. 
it's actually um, when we check with this with some some of the commercial or softwares like NV, Ecognitions, and even uh, with others, which is highly expensive and uh, which costs thousands of dollars to simulate the complete data sets of this uh, autumn. And unfortunately, we didn't find any tool in this commercial softwares also to completely automate that and uh, completely automate the transition matrix. The SCAP stats had developed these tools to openly available for the public audience and it's free of cost now. And this is the complete system which we have developed. And uh, these are the some of the other data sets based on the scale of the data sets we can play around. And uh, this is the study. This is the ESA land cover data sets. We can use this for uh, in, in, uh, in our studies. The resolution was extremely matters based on the scale which we prefer for practice. Uh, for example, if we consider this micro scale data sets of cities, these uh, 30 meter resolution will be highly useful. If we for macro scale data sets, ESA was providing from 92 year 1992-2015. Once from this data set, we can see a process and uh, do our analysis very fast. This is the video uh, of our automation tools. Here, this is the mask data sets, which we clipped from the QGS. From that, if we simulate this model for uh, regarding this, uh, it takes uh, two, two hours time for, uh, for us to simulate this Ganga Brahmaputra river basin to simulate the complete land transition matrix and automate this. But uh, based on the scale of the study, the time periods actually, dip. you can see this image has all been generated. Now this is the complete maps from 1990 to 2015. How it's completely been changing. And uh, this is the matrix, land transition matrix. This land transition matrix was the heart of our land accounting. It took uh, several hours to generate manually. It was like uh, very fast and very cheap to directly generate this uh, data sets. And uh, we can see the percentage of changes of the data from 1995 to 2000 for every year interval. And this tool, after developing this, a small customization we can use. And we can do this for uh, other resolutions, high resolutions data sets. Like uh, we can develop some supervised, unsupervised, or object oriented programming, which are used in general remote sensing audience. Uh, but uh, by using that, any classification we can. Uh, Implement after doing the classification based on the results, we can use this script to generate these matrices very fast. This is the land transition matrix. This is the metadata information for each land cover. We can see a clear transition difference from 1995 to 2015, how this land cover was being changing. And here, this, this is the herbaceous crops, and this herbaceous crops uh, was taken by this uh, urbanization, increasing the population and rapid urban growth. This it took around 28, 73 square kilometers from this herbaceous crops. And uh, even herbaceous crops taken from the other land cover classification, like wood crops and forest areas, this is the overall land cover classification, which had been taken from 1995 to 2015. And here we can see this, uh, overall difference, how it was been varying from 1995 and how it is being different distinguished between two, 2015. Uh, these are the percentage changes, amount of square kilometers of 1995 and uh, herbaceous crops, how it has been uh, increased or sorry, how it has been decreased and total amount of reduction of herbaceous crops and total square kilometers. Similarly, we can see this for urbanization. Urbanization totally taken from other classes and expanded a large amount. You can see a drastic change in the urbanizations because it's the interval was 20 years and it it's strongly affects on the other land, land cover classifications. This is the thing which we can easily do this by using QGS. 
these are the auto maps and with it's a clear visualizations which we have shown this earlier and this how the ganga brahmaputra river basin looks and the temporal changes which we had developed in this is the um, we have a the temporal changes can be seen very fast and very clean and uh, this intervals from 1995 to 2015 we can see like this but uh, the scale of the study if we reduce the difference can be done uh, in a unique pattern and this is the fiji land cover data sets we have used this for testing our uh, tools which have been developed this uh, lithia she'll uh, present she will explain brief in the later on no work and all this details so my colleague ayu will continue more on this yeah thank you so much alad and chetrini for taking us through the journey of what's possible for integrating statistical and geospatial data and thank you to our audience for your attention thus far i know a lot of you are aware and have been using these programs and that's great and then for those of you who haven't this is how you can get started um the G, as our colleagues have mentioned the GNS, gis enabled software and plugins are free and available for download from the websites listed and we will share those links shortly after the presentation our studio which was used to develop the transition matrix for the land cover change is free and available for download as well. And the data sets, as Alad mentioned, are free and available. So that's what you can do today. So what we will do next as SCAP Statistics Department is that we will continue to develop the, the slides and the guides as was mentioned before. Next slide, please, Alad. <laughs> Thanks. In this particular example, we used it to map land cover change, but we are developing other tools as well. In addition to the land cover change, um, which shows the visualization of the changes in the SIA land cover categories, there's a supplement to the land cover change tool that's being developed, and it will show how to automate the productions of the map over a specific time period. There's also one on population exposure to flood hazard using global urban footprint method. And the steps in this guide will show how to visualize the levels of exposure of a population and community to the hazard of flooding. The specific area used in this example is the Calvary River Basin in India. One other tool that's being developed is the urban land change hotspot mapping. And the steps in this guide show how to visualize the urban hotspots and the rate of urbanization along a river basin. So we are developing these tools and these guides and they will show the functionalities of QGIS and how open source programs and open source data can be used to generate visualizations, such as the ones produced and to suit any specific needs that your institutions and you may have. So thank you. These are yeah. going to be released um, in the next couple months, as seen on this slide. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ayo, and thank you, Alad. Alad, thanks uh, for taking us through uh, almost a step-by-step -step guide, uh, which I know you and Ayo are finalizing at the moment. And I see in the meeting chat that there's a lot of interest to get access to these tools, and uh, they will be coming out uh, very soon, and uh, presentations uh, and the recording of this session uh, is also available and the link has already been provided in the in the meeting chat here for any of you who want to to copy it right now. Um, Alad, also thank you for showing very clearly that uh, this automation saves a lot of time and uh, 
it does produce both maps and tables. And I know that a lot of the statisticians present in this cafe uh, will be very happy to see that uh, we still have our tables. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and can I ask you to stop sharing your screen at this point? Thank you. Um, we have a few special guests in the cafe today, and I am going to put two of them on the spot. The first one being Mr. Sohail Rastan, who is uh, calling in from Canada. Uh, Sohail is a senior research analyst at Statistics Canada, and uh, last year he also worked here at SCAP as our regional advisor on environment statistics. And Sohail has been really instrumental in initiating the work uh, uh, presented by, by Alad. A lot of inspiration from Sohail, a lot of mentoring, and not least a lot of energy. And uh, I would ask you, Sohail, now to give us your reflections on Alad's presentation uh, and, and a little elaboration on, on the use and the innovative nature of the tools that is uh, being developed at the moment. Uh, so, Hale, you have the floor. Uh, so, Hale, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. So, Hale, please. Perfect. Yeah, um, I'm very, uh, very happy to see such a work is basically going on with such a degree of uh, excitement. So, uh, I mean, I have the, uh, the origin of this work is started, I don't know, maybe uh, in September last year when, uh, when a colleague of uh, ISCA, her name was Linda, uh, she was a programmer, had nothing to do with GIS, zero knowledge of GIS. But I saw her capacity in programming, and when I saw the work of my colleague uh, from Statistics Canada, who came to SCAP to present the GIS work, Joe Filoso, uh, and the detailed documentation that he wrote, so I asked Linda if he can read that and convert it into an automated script. And she done that amazingly. And Linda is uh, joining us here as well. Then uh, Aha came, and then wow, and he took that over and he basically transformed it into the current state. Uh, but we would like to, I would like to basically acknowledge both Joe Filoso and Linda. The, the, the matrix that we've seen initially is basically the, the, the amazing work of, of, of Linda, who was working at the ESCAP. Um, what I find interesting here is let's classify things into two components now. The ESA satellite images, which everybody going to complain, ah, it's 300 by 300, it's low resolution, uh, blah, blah, blah. these are historical data. We cannot get better than that from 1994 uh, all the way to 2015. So at least let's do something with that. And this is, I think, what, what's happening here, is we are, we are learning from the historical data. And the power, as we've seen in the first presentation, of rather than doing cross-sectional study, like time one, T0, T1, what SCAB is doing is they're doing a time series study, right? They're, they're using every single year and see the change, the rate of change. And that rate of change by itself is enough to indicate some, some type of an activity happening at the 300 by 300 meter resolution. This alone, we have used the same data in Canada. Of course, we use the modest 250 by 250. And we added on them extra lenses. And the lenses were population growth from the census of population and the road network file. So we added more, more resolution on the low resolution data. So I think what you guys are doing is amazing. 
I'm very happy to see the way it's progressing. And uh, many of the of your clients, which basically including one that we're going to do right now from, which is uh, Fiji, gonna 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 use that in Kinsley and uh, for their first production of their land change government. So I think I will stop here. Um, but again, uh, Ricky, you have done a fantastic job encouraging these wonderful intellectual capitals in order to basically grow. And then, by the way. Talking about ecosystem services and goods and services, uh, let's not forget, we have to sacrifice ecosystem goods and services to generate intellectual capital. Okay? And that's something that we miss most of the time. Okay, We have to build universities and schools in order to basically generate intellectual capital. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Suhail, and, and thanks thanks for joining us today. I know that this is a, it's a horrible hour at your end. Thanks for all the encouragement from your end. Um, and, and thanks also for mentioning Linda's role in this. I've just checked and she's, uh, she's with us in the cafe today. So Linda, I hope you've taken note of the very positive feedback there. And um, a, a message here from Suhail is also, well, not everything is perfect. Let's use what we have and get on with it, basically. Uh, so that's a few more very specific pieces of advice here I hope will be useful. Um, let me move on to my second special guest here uh, today. Uh, and uh, this is a person who was mentioned in Alat's presentation. Uh, this is uh, Litia. Uh, Kurisa Kila from, who is uh, the assistant statistician at the Fiji Bureau of Statistics. And Litia has been working very closely together with uh, Alat and also with Sohail during the past couple of months to actually test out this guidance as it is being developed. And um, Litia, um, uh, I would uh, very much like it if, if you could spend the next few minutes to share what your experience has been with uh, producing land cover change maps using the guidance that Alat is developing. Uh, Litia, you have uh, the floor, please. Uh, thank you, Ricky. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so. Firstly, I just um, wanted to say thank you very much um, for all the materials and guidance, um, the time and effort that um, the team has taken up to um, help us with this compilation. Uh, just on behalf of the Fiji Bureau of Statistics, I'd just like to convey our deepest um, gratitude to the SCAP team, um, Sohil, Alahad, um, Linda, and, and uh, Rike, and um, all those who are instrumental in putting this um, putting the materials together. Uh, so initially, um, I had no idea about GIS and how to use it. And uh, But uh, this has been a, a learning process for me. And so um, for anyone there who is not um, expert in GIS, I think this uh, this method that you have come up with is, is um, pretty simple and fairly, um, I wouldn't say, uh, really easy to understand for um, for someone who's not a JS expert. So um, we one of the main reasons why we wanted to compile a land cover account was because it was one of the key thematic areas that was addressed in our um, green growth framework, and um, and that was a sustainable island and ocean resources. Um, so apart from that, we also thought it would be a good um, foundation to other importancy accounts like uh, land use, uh, experimental ecosystems, agriculture, forest, and fisheries, and then eventually oceans. Um, uh, but like everything, we had to start out trying to find the data, the appropriate data. And so we had to approach a lot of the data custodians and, and um, most of them didn't have like time series data that we wanted to use. So um, the method that uh, Allah had suggested uh, and Sohila suggested was to use the ISA um, global data. And so we, we used that. And um, 
and as well as QGIS. And that's helped us a lot to um, visualize and also quantify the changes in the different land cover uh, classifications uh, for over the period of 11 years that they had mentioned, 2005 to 2015. And um, we hope that it, uh, in future, as more um, uh, data is available to us, more updated data is available to us from our data students that will be able to continue to use this uh, as well. Uh, one of the features that I really liked was um, how QGIS um, allows you to generate uh, reports in the CSV format. And then um, I thought it was quite neat. And then it allows you to arrange and analyze the data whichever way you prefer. Um, so yeah, and we were all doing this virtually. So <laughs> I thought that was, uh, that was uh, quite an experience as well. Uh, usually we'll go and visit the, con uh, the consultant or the consultant will come and visit us. But yeah, with this um, crisis, uh, this was a really great way to, to get the work done. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's all for thank me. You. Thank you very much, uh, Litia. And, uh, and thanks for really taking on and leading this work at your end. And uh, I know it's not easy to keep up the momentum, especially when uh, physically it's not possible for us to get together. But uh, you are really doing wonders. And uh, I hope we can continue to call on you and your team to also share this experience. Uh, and uh, and I'd be very happy to pick up the, o the issue of uh, continuing towards uh, ocean accounting at a at a later stage. Uh, thanks, thanks, Litia. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to work with you and your team. Um, we are we are now moving into the Q&A session. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, many of you listening in today took uh, took some minutes to send us questions in advance. Uh, what I what I will do now is to ask uh, sort of a, a, a bit of a composite follow up question to Chitrini first and then to Alat next, uh, uh, lumping together a few of the questions that were similar in nature received from from some of you. Um, and then after that, uh, let's see, hopefully we'll have a few minutes also for some live Q&A, but uh, but time is is running. An hour is not so long, so let's let's see where we are at once. Uh, once I give uh, the floor first to Chitrini and then to Alat for a few um, follow-up questions. Um, but uh, first, uh, Chitrini, we've received a number of questions that really uh, digs a little bit deeper into the use of these uh, land cover change maps. And we have a, a number of questions we've received from colleagues at the Statistical Institute uh, uh, for Asia and the Pacific in, in Japan. And what they're basically saying in, well, is, is, well, mapping land cover changes is one thing, and it of, it's, of course, very uh, useful and important, but how can we take it to the next step to actually start addressing development issues, such, for example, how can we use it to mitigate the effects of climate change on populations, or how, how can we measure the population that we would be affected by a heat wave or a flood, etc. Uh, so how can we take it one step further? Chichirini, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, actually, for this question, I'll go back to what I have presented in the second half of my presentation, like uh, uh, not only mapping, but we have to go for the modeling uh, maybe uh, in the future and then see because there are already the uh, pro projections in the climatic parameters. So we can take into account like uh, people have already researchers and scientists have already done this, like uh, 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 looking together this land use change and then uh, the climate change into future and then uh, what will happen scenarios. There are a number of ways to uh, deal with these scenarios. Like you can explore the scenarios or you can have some definite future and then come back. Uh, but yes, the government plays a, a key role in implementing those because um, although uh, we have some master plans, uh, uh, I can give an example like from Thailand only, 
we have some master plans for uh, some areas like Songkla uh, Basin, but uh, uh, probably those are not uh, implemented. And that's why we still see the forest degradation and stuff. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, 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 uh, the government plays a huge role in the implementation stuff. But what we can do from our side is to model them and the future, uh, compare different scenarios, which is the best for us, and then plan accordingly. I mean, uh, that's what probably will be uh, good. And the regarding uh, how we can measure population, uh, if, if they are like a heat wave or flood kind of uh, uh, scenario events. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, in GIS, it's, it's not a big deal. If you have the accurate data of population density, and then you also have can map the parcels uh, of the buildings. So it depends on what scale you're working on. If a global scale, so uh, the ESA uh, uh, land covers will work like wonders. And then if like uh, very uh, 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 high detail, then you can have UAV maps and then uh, just overlay with the population density and can see like uh, after the event, like what, how much actually have hampered or something like that. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chitrini. And, and indeed, what you say, well, we can certainly go a few steps further, but for the ultimate use uh, for planning for policies, this is where we need to work together with together. a range of institutions. Yes, to yes. Make sure that we connect with the decision makers. And uh, we are back to an issue that very often comes up as a. Right. A very large challenge, which is this institutional collaboration. Um, right. But uh, but uh, I do have very good experience with uh, uh, with with collaboration at the technical level among institutions. Also eases the way for the dialogue going further mm -hmm. once we move into the policy aspects. So thank you very much, uh, Titrini, for for this very informative uh, answer, which I know. Uh, well, to a question I know many have in the back of their minds, you know, we can do so much from a technical perspective, but but then what? Um, you will also notice, uh, all of you, that uh, uh, one of the upcoming tools from, from SCAP actually focuses specifically on this um, uh, population exposure to hazards. So that goes a little bit in the in the same direction also. But of course, in order for that analysis to be of ultimate help to the population, well, measures of policy nature and planning nature need to be put into place. Thank you very much, uh, Chitrini. Let me turn to our other speaker, Alad, uh, again for a bit of a composite question. Uh, we did receive quite a number of questions that related to the IT tools, the software, the frameworks being used. Uh, so this composite question is uh, is courtesy of uh, of uh, Ms. Sulistina from BPS uh, Statistics Indonesia, from Ms. Jana Tafi from the European uh, Environment Agency, and Ms. Uh, Peiwen Chok from the Land Authority in, in Singapore. Uh, and their questions relate to, uh, and I hope you're listening now a lot because I, there will be a range here. Um, what's the difference between remote sensing and GIS? Is QGIS the best platform if you want to work with maps? What are the sources of satellite imagery? And if we look at R, uh, or other software, are there any other useful packages besides the ggplot2 in R that can help with map visualization? Uh, so this is quite a mouthful, Alad, and you're welcome to pick if you don't want to answer all of it, but the floor is yours, please. Thanks, Vicky. And uh, regarding the difference between remote sensing and GIS, both are complement to each other. But uh, remote sensing is for data acquisition and uh, processing, and GIS for analysis to decision, describe more in that in detail how this can be helpful and all to visualize and anal analytically visualize the spatial patterns. And regarding the next question, uh, well, the QGIS may not be the the best open source best 
platform it there are various others but the good part is that it's a completely open source we can't compare with this uh, other commercial softwares there has their own advantages and disadvantages but uh, qgs was free and we can use for we can customize and we can develop and uh, our own uh, plugins and platforms and there are many many data sets which are been uh, available also to include the plugins and we can play around with that and we can develop some automations and automated modelings it's quite interesting and user friendly also and basically it's for free <laughs> that's all and uh, next the regarding the r programming the there are various other plugins also like tmaps tmap tools and rs toolbox and cartographic tools these are the these are various other libraries which we can use this for um, mapping the mapping and automation modelings and all apart from ggplot2 that's it ma'am okay thank you thank you so much uh, Alad, and uh, I actually have a whole page of pre uh, of, of questions that have been sent in before this session and have yet to be answered. And we are running out of time. Uh, and uh, what I have want to say here at the very end of this hour is that a very large number of the questions that we received prior to this session and also questions running into this uh, cafe through the meeting chat relates to agricultural statistics. And uh, what I do suggest is that uh, we do a bit of an extra Q&A session very, very shortly, where I will ask a few colleagues from FAO to join us. Uh, and uh, for anyone interested, uh, uh, we will invite invite you to um, to join that where we will uh, focus solely on questions and answers. What we will do is that we will send an invitation to this follow up Q&A to everyone who registered for the cafe today and uh, and that hopefully should give us uh, some time to dig a bit more into the many topics. Uh, I see a lot of questions in the meeting chat. I see people raising hands, uh, but uh, I will suggest that we close it for the hour now. Um, but uh, thank you very much uh, for all the questions which we will pick up uh, and use for the follow up session. And I also see that there are some good pieces of advice also in the meeting chat. So I do ex uh, encourage all of you to have a good look at the at the meeting chat here, which has been running throughout this hour. And uh, I want to thank our two main speakers for today. All of you who've sent in your questions, all of you who have participated and also the uh, very profound reflections from uh, some of our special guests to this Stats Cafe. So with this, uh, thank you very much for participating. Uh, and uh, I hope we'll have a very good interactive follow up session as well. Uh, we are all very eager to continue the conversation. So thank you very much uh, and have a good day. Good evening. Good night to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rika. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank nice you. to see some faces here at the end. <laughs> Always uh, nicer than looking into a screen. Good to see you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bye. So Matrika. Yeah, bye bye. Bye. Is Alad online?